The following interview was conducted with Professor Harry Morrison, Professor of Chemistry for the Purdue University Oral History Program. It took place on Tuesday, uh, April the 14th, 2009, in his office on campus. The interviewer is Catherine Marquis, the Oral History Librarian. Welcome. Good afternoon, Dr. Hello. Morrison. Okay. Let's start. Tell us a little bit about where you were born and your parents and siblings in early years. Yeah, I was born in uh, Brooklyn, New York. Um, my dad is in a was an attorney. Um, I have an older brother who was a child psychiatrist who is now retired, lives now out in Oregon. Um, went to school in Brooklyn through junior high school and then went to a science high school called Stuyvesant High School uh, in Manhattan. Uh, happened to do that at a very early age because of some things that happened in the New York City school system when they changed from half years to full years and you could skip a grade. The bottom line is I graduated high school, I had just turned 16, so um, that certainly had an influence on my experiences in college. But uh, So yeah, my early years were were spent in Brooklyn. Tell University. us a little about what high school was like and how was the difference between it. Tell them about the, the other school that you went to, the researchers, was it more well, specialized. Stuyvesant High School is one of a set of schools that, uh, that New York has had, music and art, um, Brooklyn Polytech, Bronx High School of Science, performing arts, uh, magnet schools, which you had to take an exam to get into. Uh, it turned out that my district school was not a particularly good school and uh, my going to Stuyvesant was as much to avoid going to the district school as it was attraction to the science high school. But I was always interested in science and science. I was never totally focused on it. I, I met I met students at Stuyvesant who seemed like from the day they were born they wanted to be a physicist or astronomer or a mathematician. I was never quite that obsessed with any one thing. but. I did. I did like the fact that the high school was a uh, uh, school with a very good reputation. It even had some PhDs teaching there, which was unusual in those days. Uh, I ended up playing tennis on the high school tennis team, and in fact, uh, in my senior year, we won the city championship, which was which was kind of nice. So that, but but it's um, it's not the same high school experience you get as you would here in West Lafayette or Lafayette. Uh, you're commuting an hour each way. It's either rush hour going out or rush hour coming back. You're standing on a train for 40 minutes. Uh, you don't really make the kind of social connections that you do in a local school. I had maybe 800 students in my graduating class. That was as many students as was in the whole university that I ended up going to in college. So. Uh, it's a completely different experience. A big experience, uh, and probably, as I think I've seen in my own kids, um, you know, you always flip-flop. So I went to this very large school without much interaction, and I immediately looked for small colleges, Hamilton, um, Union in upstate New York. I ended up at a, at a school called Brandeis University, uh, which had just begun in 1948, and in fact, my brother had gone into the second class. He went in in 49, um, and it was a school which uh, was founded primarily by the Boston Jewish community and the New York Jewish community, but it was a non-sectarian school. It had taken over property from a medical school which had pretty much gone out of business, couldn't get accredited. and. Um, so I really uh, was in, 48 was the first class. Uh, I went in in 53, so I was, what, the fifth class. Right. And I knew it from my brother's days of just going up there. I knew it practically from day one. Uh, and I remember the president of that university, a man named Abraham Sacker, coming to our home in Brooklyn to recruit my brother to come. I mean, he was literally recruiting student by student trying to assure my parents that my brother, who was thinking of being uh, pre-med, that even though Brandeis at the time was not yet accredited, they would get him into medical school. He guaranteed they would be accredited. So it was very exciting and, yeah, yeah. 
an interesting time to be at that university. A lot of the faculty, um, Leonard Bernstein was on the faculty, um, Abraham Maslow in psychology, a lot of the faculty were very exciting, very vital people who were attracted to a university which was starting from scratch and had no strong bound traditions. Sure. They could invent the curriculum, they could pretty much create the university. So I went there in 53, uh, paid the price for being a 16 um, with some social interactions which were kind of amusing. Um, I, uh, my parents were educated, my dad was a lawyer, but, but not very sophisticated. And we went out shopping before I went to Brandeis and they bought me this gorgeous pair did, of yeah. rust colored sacks. In New York you did the shopping? <laughs> yeah, yeah, okay. in New York. Yeah. And I appear at Brandeis with these rust colored slacks and about two months after I get there, a couple of football players, because they had a football team at the time, came into my room and said, either you throw those <laughs> slacks away or dye them, but you're not wearing those slacks anymore. I, I okay, okay. <laughs> uh, so it took a while to it's adjust an emotionally. <laughs> yeah. Intellectually, I was fine, but sure. emotionally, I, I had to adjust. But I ended up becoming president of the student body. So uh, Was it co-ed? It was a co-ed school. Okay. Was the, were there more males and females? Or uh, probably yeah. more females than males at okay. the time. Um, very strongly liberal arts, although already the beginnings of a, of a reasonable science program. Uh, a lot of students from Boston and New York. Um, and a very, very vital experience. You know, Abby Hoffman was in the class, uh, I think with my wife, who was a year behind me. Um, uh, there were a number of people there whose names became well known for various reasons sure. as yeah. avant-garde um, in those times. Those were the hippie days, right? And we had plenty of our share. So, uh, yeah, I got involved in in leadership positions in the student body. I basically wrote the student constitution. I wrote the we created a student court, and I basically wrote the document that laid out the student court. So by the time I finished, even though I was a chemistry major and doing all those things, um, I had a lot of broadening experiences, which uh, I think were very important to me. I, Sounds I, like it, yeah. I played tennis again. I was on the tennis team. I wasn't a great tennis player. I was certainly not one of the best there. But um, that also... You know, the athletics rounded things out a little bit. Sure. So it was a good time. The incoming class was at that time maybe 250 students. And it's grown since then. But, uh, and they have a graduate program. Oh, basically. now they're a very What was the infrastructure university. like at that time? Were there many buildings? They were, there were a few buildings inherited from the medical, medical school. school. There's a castle there, which is still there, literally brought by some man who owned that property stone by stone from England. It's literally a castle with inner, you know, hidden passageways and so on. And and it became a woman's dormitory, except that what many of the women didn't know was that the lounge was used for autopsies in the medical school. They didn't they didn't mention that to the girls. I think that might have <laughs> caused them a little problem. Uh, and then gradually uh, the campus was built. And if you went there today, of course. It doesn't look anything sure. like those days. Yeah. Do they still use that building, though? Yep. Castle still used. Still yeah. a residence hall. Yeah. Um, I mean, it's one of these stone structures that'll last forever. Lord, yes, you know. right. Like the cathedrals in Europe, they right. built by hand, and they yeah. never going to yeah, go. Yeah. No, no, no. This building, I think, a tornado could come through, and nothing. Right. Affected. Exactly. So from there, I uh, I went to um, well. So in college, I was pre med. I took. Um, uh, courses like vertebrate embryology, which I certainly didn't need as a chemistry major, um, thinking I might go to medical school. But I also was becoming more and more enamored with science. Um, and in my junior year, um, I, I told my wife I had to make two primary decisions, whether she and I would get married. Is that where you met your wife? Was yeah. there? Okay. Yeah, I was a sophomore. She was a freshman. She didn't know that she was a few months older than me, even though I was a sophomore, until I informed her. She always laughs about this to this day. I'm a sophomore. She's a freshman. I'm going back to New York to get my driver's license. 
<laughs> and she said, you're just now going to get your driver's license? She was really <laughs> very put off by the fact that she had robbed the cradle. Um, and so, you know, we, we were dating for several years. I met her the first week she came, freshman year. Uh, and, yeah, I decided this was it. We should get married, and we did after my first year in graduate school. And the other thing was, was I going to go to medical school or go to graduate school? And my brother had already gone to medical school. He had been a math major, and he told me there are no mediocre mathematicians. Either you're a great mathematician or you shouldn't be a mathematician. And he knew he wasn't a great mathematician, so he went to medical school. Um, I didn't feel quite the same way about chemistry. I thought you could be a medium chemist. Yeah. Um, and my dad came up and actually interviewed the faculty to find out what this chemist does. I mean, chemistry is not something, especially in those days, known to many people. It was more, you know, if you ask somebody who a chemist was, they point to the local drugstore. You know, the pharmacist was the chemist. And I had and several uncles who were pharmacists. And in some drugstores, that was the term that they yeah, would Yeah, it's the chemist, right? And right. I had... And they had um, the logo whenever. Right, and I had cat uncles who were, who were pharmacists. So... Yeah. Yeah, you know, he wanted he wanted to know why I would want to possibly stay behind a bench with a white coat, never see anybody, be isolated for the rest of my life. And that was his vision. And uh, I don't know. I convinced him. The faculty convinced him that this wasn't such a terrible thing, and that I could have a a good life as a chemistry um, scientist, science professor, or or industrial chemist. So I went to graduate school and uh, went to Harvard. And um, how'd you have me select that? Well, I, I was primarily interested either in Harvard or Illinois, and I don't know why Illinois. You know, like so many other um, undergraduates, you're heavily influenced by the faculty. I was doing undergraduate research uh, for a professor at Brandeis who was a Harvard graduate. And he certainly was pushing me in that direction. And Illinois had a very fine reputation at that time. And I, I guess I knew if I didn't get into Harvard, uh, there was a good chance I was going to get into Illinois. Uh, I did get into Harvard, and um, I was, you know, one of your questions has to do with um, times in your life that were particularly outstanding events in your life. And my background in chemistry at Brandeis was, uh, uh, was uh, incomplete. Um, we had a couple of very good faculty, but they were still building the department. So I, for example, had uh, not really much of a physical chemistry background. Uh, the inorganic chemistry was taught by a guy from Lincoln Labs who was, in retrospect, crazy because one day he left me doing an experiment uh, in a teaching lab. Uh, it was going over the time of the lab. So he left and the class left and left me alone with an experiment involving white phosphorus, which is flammable in the air. And I was bubbling a gas to prevent it from reaching oxygen. So what gas did we use? We didn't have nitrogen or, or other inert gases at that time. We used fuel gas from the gas line. So here I am bubbling fuel gas into a reaction with white phosphorus, all the makings of, you know, I mean, white phosphorus was used in Vietnam. Uh, so I lift the top of this to try to loosen up this bubble, and of course air gets in, the whole thing explodes and blows me across the room, uh, burns me up to both elbows completely. Um, and we joke that in today's world, of course, I would have, it would now be called Morrison University. I would have sued that university for everything they had. My dad was even an attorney, but the ne thought never occurred to us. I mean, we wouldn't do that. That night, I was, elect I was elected president of the chemistry <laughs> club. <laughs> but We uh, see a leader in the future. Yeah, right here, yeah, yeah. So, so Can I Can handle to, explosive situations. Right. So I went to Harvard with a very um, incomplete background, and it, it cost me. Uh, we had entry exams there. Uh, which qualifying exams, which we used to give at Purdue, which you had to pass before the end of the first year. And I managed to fail the physical chemistry exam twice, and I had one more time to pass it. Uh, 
And this is after studying the whole summer between my senior year and, and graduate school to take the inorganic analytical, physical and organic exams. I had had virtually no analytical chemistry, a weak physical chemistry. So, uh, yeah, I ended up passing the third time. And I think, um, you know, in retrospect now, looking back over those days, um, without trying to blow a horn or anything, I, I think that sort of set a, a pattern of, of just, you know, if there's an obstacle, settling down and working towards that overcoming that obstacle. I think it really taught me, um, well, that I either was going to have to do something to be successful or not. And yeah, I guess I could have been successful flunking out of Harvard, but I, I, don't, <laughs> I don't think I'd have the career I have now if I did. Um, the end of my stay at Harvard, um, professor came through uh, who ultimately won the Nobel Prize in chemistry. He was at the Swiss Federal Institute in Zurich. He gave a lecture which just blew me away. It was uh, the very beginnings of what we would now call bio-organic chemistry, the merger, marriage of organic chemistry insights into the beginnings of understandings of how biochemical reactions work, how enzymes work, and so on. And this was in 61. And uh, I just was fascinated. I still had this biological interest anyway, even though I didn't go to medical school. Mm -hmm. And so he said if I could get my own money, he would give me a place in the lab. And I applied. Oh, a funny thing happened in <laughs> it, while I was in graduate school. So I applied for an NIH graduate fellowship. And I get a letter back saying, well, we would like to award you the fellowship, but we've run out of money, basically. Well, I didn't know that that's a standard letter. Everybody gets, you know, NIH would send that and then tell Congress, we've awarded 2,000, but we can only fund 500, give us more money, right? So that's their standard letter. Well, I was a little naive. So the next year, my second year, uh, announcement comes out that they're giving out fellowships again graduate fellowships. So I wrote a letter to the NIH. <laughs> I said, I noticed you're giving out fellowships again. Can I please have mine? <laughs> they gave they gave it to me. I think I think they were so shocked at this that you letter. Remembered. Well, you know, that anybody would even write such a letter. I mean you have to really be naive as hell, I mean, to do that. And I was naive. But I got the scholarship fellowship. So anyway, uh, I applied for a NATO fellowship to go to Switzerland. Well, NATO, Switzerland's not in NATO, but they awarded a fellowship to go to <laughs> to Switzerland, which was always amusing. They liked your your letter. Uh, <laughs> I think I, no, I think they did do that. Uh, in they, I wasn't the first to go to Switzerland, but it was really strange that they would do that. So we went to Switzerland, Harriet and I, and um, I had a an interesting year. It wasn't very productive. It did give me a little more bio experience and research. I Primarily, I matured. You know, when I left graduate school, I was now 20. And you spend all your time in graduate school worrying about your thesis project. I really hadn't had time to think about what I wanted to do. Once you got it. Yeah, and, and you know, what kind of research I wanted to do. I knew I wanted to be a professor, but, but I wasn't quite sure in doing what. And so it gave me a chance to read and, and just grow a little bit. Uh, we had our experiences there. We were a month in Zurich. My wife had taken German for a number of years. I had had German. We knew some German. And I'm salting my food, and it's just not getting salty. So we've been there a month. And I finally put some in the palm of my hand, and I taste and it's surely not salty. So I said to Harriet, you know, the salt isn't salty. So she goes to the box, and instead of it being salts, it's sypha, soap. They made granulated, very finely granulated soap that would come through a salt shaker. She had misread sypha for salts. <laughs> we had been soaping our food for a month. She was ready to leave that. Uh, so we had a good year there. It ended up with a bad automobile accident, which sort of cut it short a little bit. Um, 
but we came back and I had a second year of postdoctoral research in Madison and at that time I really decided what I wanted to do which was to go into this field of photochemistry which the professor in Madison was specializing in. So I sort of found my field at that point and subsequently in my, my research has been in in some aspect of photochemistry throughout my career at Purdue partly more physical kind of photochemistry, partly biological. So um, about half of my research over the years has been the way in which light affects biological systems and half has been more classical physical organic chemistry. Spent a year in Madison and then um, had three job offers, one from Purdue uh, one from Merck and one from DuPont and decided I really did want an academic career. We got <laughs> still, a, she's from Boston, I'm from New York, you know, we're still East Coast folks and uh, Philadelphia was West, you know, Chicago was the far West. And, and California, and California exist. didn't exist. So <laughs> we're in Madison, Wisconsin and I get a letter to come down to Lafayette, Indiana to uh, Interview and first I had to find Indiana on the map, and then and then Lafayette, uh, and my wife who was brought up in Boston and never saw herself living in at that time, sixty three we had fifteen thousand undergraduates, pretty small town Indianapolis was really just a larger small town, um, we didn't have I sixty five it was fifty two so. It, it took a long time to go north or south, and we joked that she only took ten years to stop crying. I mean, you know, she was a good she was a good soul. Uh, she was those days you went where your husband went. She had taught third grade while I was in graduate school, and then retired, basically to raise our family. And um, what we valued here was that it was a great place to raise a family, as you know. You know, it's kids. There was no carpooling. Um, the kids got on a bike and they went anywhere. You know, they went to high school on a bike. They went to little league field on a bike. Everything. Was, people when we got here still left their doors unlocked. You know, there was no such thing as security systems. What was it like when you first came? To, you know, Dr. Ringel has experienced his his time when he first came. What was it? Well, he got a ride or something, and he, you know, the train dropped him off. Or well, yeah, he yeah. tells the story yeah, about being dropped off at the airport. railroad station. Yeah, I know, I know that story. <laughs> um, well, you know, Did one you of the things the that happened to us is there were no apartments. Um, was Williamsburg the was just beginning. Oh, okay. And did you uh, have children at the time that you we, came? Harriet was eight months pregnant. Okay. So the the baby was born September. Uh, 21st, no, sorry, October 1st. Uh, our first son was born October 1st, but he was due like in the beginning of September. And so she was very pregnant, and we wanted a house. We didn't want an apartment. She didn't certainly didn't want to march up and down stairs because in that accident she had already injured a knee and, and she wasn't that mobile. Sure. So... Um, we got here looking for a place to live in like late July and you ran to the paper to find what was for rent because you didn't have anything like the availability of apartments and there was this little house which is still there, it's on Fowler Avenue, it's a little white national home which is on an angle to the street just before you get to the curve to go around to the campus. You see it there now. There was a there's an old house that was near it, and then there was a big fraternity house, which is now gone. Sure. And uh, the landlady lived in that older house next to this national home. And we got there at about 10.30 in the morning, and she said, well, somebody's just been here, and they said they might come back, and I don't know what to do. And I took out my wallet, and I said, here's the first month's rent. <laughs> we, we Can we have the house now? And she looked at me, she said, sure. So we had we found a place to live, uh, but it was really hard to find housing here at the, in that time. Mm -hmm. um, the campus was, uh, you know, much smaller. Um, so much has been built since then. 
Um, but the chemistry program from day one was always a large program, one of the largest in the country. And at the time that I came here, you know, Professor Brown was already here. There were some really, really well-known names of organic chemistry, Bob Benkazer, Bill Truce, Nathan Kornblum, Jim Brewster. Uh, we had a whole group of organic chemists who were among the very best in the country, mm -hmm. uh, Professor Brown, of course. And um, so I was joining a faculty with some really outstanding people. In those days, we took 100 graduate students a year into the program, 100 a year. And of those, fully half might be interested in organic chemistry, which meant even as a young assistant professor, I could be bringing in three or four students per year into my research group. So at, at the maximum, I had as many as maybe, with postdocs, maybe as many as 15 or 16 people in my group. So you were able to run a very strong program here. Um, this department has always had wonderful infrastructure support of uh, the teaching, the very large teaching program in chem When I got here in 63, every single student at Purdue, no matter what their major, had to take chemistry. Every student had to take chemistry, freshman chemistry. So that drove the size yeah. of the department. Oh, yeah. uh, I mean, for that, you need a, a lot of graduate TAs. For all those graduate TAs, you need a lot of faculty. So really, the program size was driven by, by that requirement. I see. And, um, you got lab, you got the labs? Well, the labs were renovated for me, uh, the ones that were down the hall. Uh, as I mentioned before we started this, uh, one was interior, one was exterior. But sure. yeah, we didn't use hoods nearly to the extent that we do today. So there was like one hood per lab. Now you, you, you feel like you really don't have a quality lab if you don't have one hood per student. You'd have to explain that to, to safety. Um, so we did a lot more in those days outside of the hood than, than certainly we do today. Right, right. And that's, so that's my schooling experience up to the point of coming right. here. And then you, um, you were also the division head for the organic chemistry. So uh, I, 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 yeah, I was an assistant professor in, in 63, uh, became associate in 69. So, y you know, in terms of, of events that shaped me or my life. I, I mentioned that year, which was very stressful at Harvard. Um, I was not promoted to associate professor in my fifth year, which was typical in those days. Um, there were some reasons for it, some political, some otherwise. And again, this was a very stressful time. I mean, your whole life is in front of you. If you don't get promoted to tenure, in this next year, now what? Well, in those days, the chemical industry was hiring a great deal, so it was never a bad thing. I mean, you could go to DuPont or Merck, as I had offers initially for, and double your salary. It's not a bad fallback, but it wasn't what I wanted to do. I really wanted to do academic research. And so, again, I just knuckled down and did the things I felt I needed to do to be successful, and uh, yeah, obviously I'm here, so I was promoted. Sure. Uh, but I would say those two times, as I reflected on your questions, um, that first year at Harvard and that year when I, I had a very interesting meeting with the department head. His name was Joseph Foster, he's a biochemist. Uh, when I came, Earl McBee was the head. He had been head for quite a number of years. Uh, when I got here, it was just the beginning of the end of the little departmental dictators. So Purdue had this tradition of having people who were heads of their departments, Henry Koffler in biology, McBee here, uh, who, would, who were heads for 20 years and basically ran the department, owned the department, hired, fired, etc. Literally hired on their own. And uh, that, that system was crumbling at about the time I came. McBee was eventually sort of removed by making him a distinguished professor <laughs> a few years after I got here. So Joseph Foster was the first head after McBee was uh, deposed. 
And Foster called me into his office uh, when I learned that, that I had not been promoted in my fifth year, and he said, uh, Harry, he said, this is going to sound very strange. He said, I can see you becoming president of the university, but I'm not sure you're going to get promoted to associate professor. So that was something that you are. <laughs> I would say so. Right. And, and actually, it, it was it was an interesting comment. So um, did get promoted. Uh, ultimately, was division head. Um, then for, became department head. Let me uh, for yeah. the researchers. Division head just might make that. Was it was it like a unit? Yeah, okay. yeah. We have uh, the chemistry department is broken into. Subdisciplines: organic chemistry, physical, inorganic, biochemistry, analytical, chemical education. And so the organic faculty number still does, of the order of 12 to 14 faculty. In this department, the division head makes teaching assignments, uh, deals with space issues. Come in, but you just can't run it totally um, from the main office. You need subdivisions. Sure. Okay. And uh, that was good experience for you. Well, it, it was uh, probably my most memorable experience. Then was I was sitting in this office, and uh, one of the faculty's research group size had dropped, and we needed his space. And space to the scientist is more dear than money. Spouse, children doesn't make. They all come second to your research space. It's sort of uh, not only critical to your research, it's a, it's a sign of your prestige. You, know? if you reduce the square footage, somehow you're being reduced as a, per as a person. So we told this particular professor we needed to take one of his labs that he wasn't really needing and using to give it to a new young faculty member. And he kept refusing and refusing and finally I sent him a note. And why it fell on me as division head instead of the department head, I don't know, but it, I was asked to do it. And then the note simply said, dear so-and-so, um, we need you to move out of this lab by Friday. If you have not vacated the lab, we will have to send people from our shop to remove things so that the new person can move in. And that note wasn't on his desk more than probably a half an hour when there was a knock on this door. The door burst open. The, the professor involved, standing in front of me, had a look on his face that if, if looks could kill, I would have been dead. In front of me, he tore the note up into the smallest possible little pieces, threw it in my face, <laughs> slammed the door, and walked out. Uh, he, di he did move out of the lab. But about a minute after he slammed the door, the secretaries opened the door very carefully to see if I was still alive. They, they didn't know what had happened, did he? So yeah, as a division head, you, you did start to have to face some of the things that certainly you come to face as a department head or a dean. Uh, I served as division head um, for so what? I, I don't even 84, remember. 67 to 84, and then to 84. Sure, in a couple of years, then move into the And then, um, interesting, I, I uh, was asked by the head search committee in 93 to be on the short list for head of the department. And uh, the dean didn't choose me, he chose. Harry Pardue, who was another very well-known and quite quite good chemist. And so I was not chosen to be head. And to be honest, I wasn't at that time particularly excited about being head, and it probably was the best thing that happened to me because I was able to keep my research going successfully, which I came to learn is much more difficult when you're ahead. Uh, I did uh, go on sabbatical in 97. I was out in Berkeley. There was another head search at that time. We, uh, we rotate our department heads in this department ever since McBee, uh, typically every five years, and was asked to become head uh, in 90, in 90, 80, uh, sorry, in, uh, in 87 to, to 92, 92. Right. 87 to 92. So I guess it was like in 80, two or three that the previous one had been. 
So I was on sabbatical in 87, was head till 92, and then the deanship opened up in the college, and I became dean um, in 92. And while I was, uh, again, it was, it was sort of, some things happened fortuitously. So while I was head, I was approached about becoming a dean uh, out in Arizona, and I said, okay, I'll interview. I wasn't sure I really wanted to do that. And it was of arts and sciences, so it was a huge job, clearly not consistent with maintaining a research program. And I was maintaining my research program, even as head. I didn't get the position, and I think I, I knew subsequently one reason why I didn't, and that is because I told the president of the university I wasn't sure I wanted to do this. Well, you know... I, you, you get more sophisticated as you move through life, and of course, I wasn't totally stupid about it, but I, I, I realized that once I became dean and was hiring myself, you don't typically hire somebody who's, who is ambivalent. And I was ambivalent. I, I really wasn't sure I wanted to give up my research sure. program. So the deanship opening here was very fortuitous because probably this was just about the only place where I would have been able to sustain my research program. Uh, to move somewhere else as a dean uh, undoubtedly would have wiped me out. And I did maintain grants, graduate students, postdocs, virtually throughout my headship and my deanship. And I always valued that. I always told people that as much as I did enjoy certainly many aspects of administration, both as head and as dean, I never ever got the gratification out of doing that that I got when I came over here from the math building, sat down with my graduate students and poured through their research and, and their findings and their proposed experiments. It was, it was a matter of just shutting one side down and opening the other side of the brain and and it kept me sane, I think, as an administrator, uh, because I could switch one off and switch right. the other one and off. And do both. And do both. Right, that's key. And it gave me balance, and it gave me perspective. And uh, I think, you know, today uh, deans do a lot more fundraising than we did in our day. Uh, President Beering really didn't even discuss that. Uh, when, when had, he had Vision 21. Remember he, he did, did yeah. but, it, but the, the deans and the department heads at that time were not being interviewed or even hired with the point of view of how good a fundraiser they would okay. be. It may have been on, on Beering's mind, but you know it just wasn't, a, it wasn't part of the conversation. And the fundraising was really led by the development office, the development officers, and the dean, you know, did it, but it wasn't certainly nowhere near the level of importance it has had since President Jiski yeah. came and Murray Blackwell. So you didn't spend as much time traveling in those days, and I always felt that a dean who didn't, in those days, who didn't have something else happening was dangerous. <laughs> had too much time on their hands yeah. to, to, to get themselves into a micromanagement Situation, and I always value delegating, and I always try to avoid micromanaging. And so, I always said that you know maybe research is a fifty or sixty percent FTE position, usually teaching and service of the rest, and being a an administrator of a department or or a school in those days was maybe a 75% position. So as long as I could do 140%, I was, I was okay. Yeah, but job. I also wasn't just doing 75% and, and, and doing mischief with the other 25% of my time. <laughs> oh, you're very good. I wonder, one thing, I, that new program that um, you started, the environmental thing, I think, that went over the, the deans, um, well, you, you mentioned that in your yeah, list I of saw questions. That, we. We I saw a couple of news releases on that, and I right. And now with so much, and it, it 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 sort of interdisciplinary because you're pulling from various departments. I I, I would say um, from vi 
in my own research, I, I collaborated heavily with people in biology and pharmacy. Uh, doing even today, I, I've got animal studies going on with vet medicine. At a meeting this morning, uh, to test a chemical we've developed that kills cancer with light. I was going to ask you about that. That's yeah. just something new you're working with. Um, well, it's it's cancer center. It's not new. Oh. Uh, I was a member of the cancer center for many years. Okay. But we have one chemical, call it a drug, if you will, which we decided um, really needed. We we could kill cancer cells in petri dishes. But we needed to do it on an animal to, to really see if this was going to have any promise. And we got money from the university's Trask Fund, which is a fund using dollars brought in from licensing and patents that the university gives out in grants several times each semester. It's designed to do key experiments which will take technology from, from wherever it's at, maybe to the point where Excellent. the research could be licensed to someone. So we have that award, and we've been doing mouse studies um, with melanoma cancer using our drug and light to see if we can cure, kill the melanoma, cure the mouse. And we have some very positive results. It's not by any means conclusive yet. Right. Um, but from a long, from a very early stage in my career, I, I've always valued collaborations and interdisciplinary research. And Mark Hermanson, who I, I'm sure you may know, he was head of the biochemistry department for many years, 20 some on, in the Ag School. Mark and I both were very active voices for many years about trying to do more on this campus in the way of creating interdisciplinary initiatives. And uh, the environmental uh, Engineering and Science Center was created in that time. I'm not even sure whether the current center subsumed it, replaced it. I don't know how it's used. Uh, but even as dean, we pushed very hard for there to be multidisciplinary uh, centers which would maximize our our resources and and be efficient. So we did this with microscopy. We did it with, um, or tried to do it with the machine shop. We did it with nuclear magnetic resonance. Uh, a lot of things that we tried to do which would leverage this university because Purdue has always been an underfunded university forever. I mean, President Beering used to cite statistics, and I'm sure you can cite them today, talking about how many dollars we get per student from the state relative to our Big Ten colleagues, and uh, we always were close to the bottom. It may be a little different now that our tuition is higher. There was a time, as you may recall, when a Michigan student could pay our out-of-state tuition, and it would be less than the in-state tuition in Michigan. Um, so we're always underfunded. We're always trying to do a lot with less, and clearly interdisciplinary centers and efforts are a way of doing that. So yeah, the Environmental Engineering and Science Center was sure. one such effort. Right. Um, we set up a computer research institute or center. We, we did a few things like that. Um, and, and I like to think that those efforts, and again I mentioned Mark Hermanson because um, he and I were blowing that horn for many, many years. I gave several presentations on multi-user research resources, M-U-R-R-R, multi-user research, two R's, <laughs> um, to try to convince the university that it should pay attention to this and, and develop it. And I think, in many ways, the Discovery Park concept uh, is an outgrowth of those early efforts to identify key areas as we did with the Discovery sure. Park. Now the Discovery Park concept itself was very new in the sense of sort of bridging um, academic research on the way to, let's say, the research park. That, that was certainly not in our equation. Right. 
but the idea of getting faculty together uh, on multidisciplinary programs certainly was something we felt we needed for a right. long time. Right. right. Good. And then, of course, you had your then that anniversary of the School of Science in '93. That was kind of nice. Yeah. Yeah. yeah um, Those it, are sort of it's it's a nice okay. way to right. to provide perspective. You know. Um, for the alumni and the students. And yeah, science, um, you know, was not the original program here as a land-grant university, ag and engineering sure. were the primary uh, initiatives. And so science really grew up as a support for engineering and agriculture. And only in more modern times did science start to really develop in its own right. So really, Purdue's chemistry program as a PhD program is still relatively recent on the national time scale. Right, right. Um, many other programs predate us. We're much older. But our evolution is not that different from other land-grant universities. Right, right, right. Uh, you, let's see, um, you want to mention some of your awards? Any special ones that you'd like to cite? For well, They're all important. Uh, yeah, uh, I, I value the Frank Martin Award um, uh, because I do, uh, I do think I'm a good teacher, and right. it was nice to feel that the students appreciated that. Uh, I've always enjoyed teaching. Today, uh, other than the research I'm doing in the vet school, uh, that and service committees and things um, are what I do and and if I didn't love teaching I wouldn't be here right. um, so I really love interacting with the kids um, another award which is a, actually a very um, unusual award and, and I'm kind of proud of it um, for some reason the department decided to create an award and I wasn't even part of that discussion it was uh, in 1990, okay. and it was called the Wetherill Award. I don't even know it's on my no. CV. Okay. Uh, and it was, it was, d it was designed to honor somebody in the department for their service to the department. And as I said, I, I had no idea that that this was being done, and I was head of the department at the time, and I was made the first recipient. And the reason that's so special <laughs> is because department heads, you know, don't always <laughs> have that kind of recognition or respect by the faculty. It's very special. My, my, my comment, you know, we have a five-year sort of rotating headship. Uh, now it's pretty common in the university. At the time we did it, it was new in the 60s. Um, we were one of the only departments to do that. And my comment was, uh, you alienate one or two faculty a week. You know, Certainly by the end of five years, you've made enemies from everybody. It's time to move on and bring in the next one, right? So the idea that the faculty would do that, I, I, was, I was very moved by that. Um, and then, you know, the most recent award, which is kind of interesting, it's on the annual report. It's not on that Vita. I is a College of Science um, service. I think it's called Distinguished Service Award Leadership Award. And I had no idea that this award was coming. It was. It's this year. Uh, Has it already been awarded? Or it's it been awarded okay. uh, in a college uh, function and will be again recognized in a week or two in a departmental function. And I remember, I, I wrote to the department and I said, what is this all about? And he said, well, you know, we put you up for this leadership award. And I said, why? Well, it turns out that um, the National Science Foundation um, about a year ago said that it was going to start requiring uh, plans for broadening um, the population in science, i.e. diversifying um, in the more common nomenclature. And the diversity is, to some people, almost become a word they don't use. But basically diversifying um, 
the chemistry population, and NSF wants to do generally not just chemistry. And and large grants were going to need a diversity plan uh, to be considered. So the department head put out a call in that time, so over a year ago now, about a year ago, and asked for volunteers to be on a committee to draft such a plan. <laughs> so I wrote him an email and I said, uh, I'd be happy to try. So he called me up and he said, well, you're the only one who volunteered. Would you be willing to chair it? <laughs> I said, okay. So basically he asked me to gather my own committee, which I did. And probably in record time, we went from about March through July, put together a diversity plan, which was finally approved by the faculty in the fall. And most recently I've been asked to chair a committee, different committee, which is implementing this plan. Uh, and so that award apparently was for the leadership in crafting this diversity plan. Well, you've done some work with the minorities and, and Absolutely. Over, over time, and yeah. I, that comes out very clearly in many of the things yeah. that I've read. And so you had some experience and exposure and things that you've been trying to do, and I usually ask something about diversity, and they, they respond, and things that have been done, and there's still a lot lot to be done in that area. Yeah, we, uh, you know, Sally Mason created a diversity leadership group. And she had that mosaic. Right, and I was asked to be on that group, and so I was part of the group sure. that created mosaic. Um, uh, yeah, I have had a long standing interest in fostering minorities. You know, it's, it's, it's not just the minority thing. Uh, my style has always been to get the most out of people for whom I'm responsible. Uh, I've always felt that my success in administration, whether as a head or as a dean, is judged in part by how successful the people are who work for me. And so if I'm doing my job right, I'm maximizing communication among them and I'm enabling them, I'm empowering them. And so very early on, uh, for example, we created the Women in Science program in a more formal way. Martha Chiskin had been sort of trying to do some things, but we literally, when I became dean, created a Women in Science program. Barb Clark was put in charge of it. Um, and I know that that has had a, a big impact on women in the College of Science here terms of the numbers of hires and retention and so on. Um, and it, it to me it's just because that's what we ought to do, you know, I mean. Um, it's nothing out of the ordinary. It's not, you. right. I mean, it, the, this, is, this is skill, this is people. Uh, they deserve all the same opportunities and P.S. We get an awful lot out of it if we maximize the output of all of the people who are contributing Good to the point. college. I agree. What um, your current activities, your research? Have you are you semi-retired? Or? I'm not semi-retired. What I what I'm I'm full time. But you stepped down from I, the dean. I stepped out as dean in 2002. I reached 65 and 10 year uh, had been dean for 10 years, but upper administration you have to step down at 65. So it probably worked out well anyway. 10 years I think is as long as somebody should do any uh, administrative job. I went on sabbatical for a year and. Um, Came back in 03 and started teaching again sophomores and juniors in organic chemistry, typically life science students, pre-meds and otherwise. And that's what I've been doing along with a lot of the service. I, I, I've told the department heads, each of them as they've come in, uh, you tell me how I can help you and I'm happy to do that. And so, you know, the, the diversity plan was, was one example of that. When I came back, I told the department head we really should involve the faculty in the development effort, uh, and I suggested he create a development committee uh, with our development officer and faculty, and he did, and he asked me to chair that. And so we, we just met yesterday, and um, that's sort of novel. I'm not sure even to this day how many other departments really have a faculty committee working with the right. development officer. Uh, so I've tried to be as useful as I can. I'm very sensitive to the fact that I'm no longer managing graduate students, so I feel I need to pay my way 
in any other way I can. Very good. Yeah. Uh, the research we're doing with the mice and our photoactivated chemical is exciting. It's interesting. I met with them this morning. Uh, positive results, still not publishable, but we're moving along. Right, right. So it's fun. I, yeah. I really enjoy teaching, and uh, I've enjoyed it throughout my career. And in those years, when I was department head and dean, I didn't teach because I had no time to both do research, administration, teach. So when I came back to teaching in 03, I had not taught in the classroom for 18 years. And it was like I was starting all over again. I literally spent part of my sabbatical just trying to reinvent in the modern day right. how I was going to teach. And I came up with Get a retooled. style. Yeah. Came up with a style and a method which I think has worked well, but it's very, very different from writing on the blackboard the way I did <laughs> before <laughs> right. I came to play. Right. Uh, in closing, any uh, do you have an outstanding event that you like that comes to mind? You may have mentioned that. Uh, well, you before. know, I guess um, I I if you're talking about outstanding events in my life or outstanding yeah. events, events in your good. life, yeah. I, I think, you know, I was thinking about that question when we talked earlier. Mm -hmm. And and I would come back to the two I mentioned, uh, right. which, you know, are not outstanding in terms of, uh, of being positive. Uh, they okay. were, in fact, outstanding because there, they were negative. different variations in right. how you look at but, it. Right. But they were outstanding in retrospect right. because they sort of like steel and fire, right? I mean, they honed me. They uh, g Getting over an obstacle working your tail off to do it uh, is a good experience. and um, It's lasting. It's lasting and it's, it's allowed me uh, to talk to my sons who are attorneys, two of them and one a physician, who at various points in their career have faced similar things. And, and I've been able to say to them, here's what happened to me and here's how it ended up and here's how I succeeded and you do what you need to do, and you'll succeed too, and it's worked every time. Very good. Yeah. yeah. Any other, uh, any special things that you'd like to say in closing? No, you know, Purdue, um, I hardly knew it existed. I had heard of it as a graduate student. It was a big school in the Midwest. Um, we didn't know this area. We didn't know this city. Um, but here we are f 46 years later, <laughs> it's pretty amazing to say it. Um, I feel the same way when someone asks me like you did. <laughs> I mean, you know, I walked down the hall a couple of months ago and there was a problem going on. And one of two faculty were talking and, and one of the faculty asked me to for advice and I gave the person some ideas and some suggestions <laughs> And the second faculty member said, you're the granddaddy of this department, or you're the grandpa of this department. And I walked away and I said, have I just been complimented? I still feel like I remember when I first walked in this place. Uh, we all do, right? I mean, we all remember our early days like they were yesterday. And uh, it's because hard for me to believe. You get on in years. I but think. here I am, 46 years at the same place, and it's been good. You know, Purdue University has been a very good place to, to spend my career. I have no regrets. And I thank you very much, Dr. Morrison. Very good. You're Nancy. welcome.